Welcome to the Deep Dive, where we plunge into complex topics to find those uh, surprising nuggets of insight. Today, we're unraveling something often just kind of dismissed as simple sugar, but which is in fact incredibly intricate and absolutely essential. Mm. Carbohydrates. Did you know these aren't just energy sources, but the most abundant biomolecules on our planet? Every single year, photosynthesis converts something like, what, 100 billion metric tons of CO2 and H2O into these compounds. It's staggering. Our mission today is to really unpack the fascinating world of sugars. We'll explore their diverse structures, their you know, countless functions, and their critical roles in everything, from fueling our bodies to mediating complex cell communication. We're going deep, uh, guided by the foundational insights from Leninger principles of biochemistry. That's exactly right. And this isn't just about you know what we stir into our coffee. This deep dive is really a journey. We're starting with the simplest sugar building blocks and moving towards these incredibly complex, information-rich molecules. We'll reveal how the most subtle nuances of a molecule structure can dictate profound biological functions. It's like uncovering the grammar of life's oldest language. Okay, let's unpack this, starting right at the beginning. Monosaccharides, these are the single sugar units, right? Yep. The fundamental bricks are essentially organic compounds with a carbonyl group that carbon oxygen double bond and lots of hydroxyl groups, the OHs. The most abundant one, the one we run on, is D-glucose. And then there's D-fructose, the one that makes fruit sweet. Yeah, and what's really fascinating here is this idea of handedness or chirality. Almost all monosaccharides have at least one asymmetric carbon. They can exist as mirror images, like your left and right hand. And our bodies, well, specifically the enzymes dealing with these sugars, they're incredibly picky, highly stereospecific. They strongly prefer one-handedness over the other. It's like, you know, trying to put your left glove on your right hand just doesn't work well. We call these DNL isomers. And sometimes sugars differ at just one specific chiral center. We call those epimers. Tiny difference, big implications for how our body uses them. That handedness idea is, wow. It's really profound, and you see its power everywhere. There's a perfect example in Box 7-1 from Leninger, What Makes Sugar Sweet? It talks about our sweetness receptors proteins on our tongue from the TAS1R2 and TAS1R3 genes. They're designed for a very precise 3D fit. A sweet molecule clicks in, sends the sweet signal, makes sense evolutionarily, right, to find energy. But here's the kicker. Artificial sweeteners like aspartame, the SS version, sweet. But flip just one chiral center to RS aspartame and it tastes bitter because that tiny shape change means it can't do the precise three-point binding for sweetness. It hits a bitter receptor instead. It's incredible. It really is a tiny atomic shift, a completely different perception. And speaking of structure in water, like in our cells, these monosaccharides rarely stay in that simple open chain form. They prefer to curl up into rings. Uh, either five-membered pyranoses or six-membered pyranoses. This happens when a hydroxyl group reacts with the carbonyl carbon within the same molecule, forms a stable ring. And this ring closure creates a new special carbon, the anomeric carbon. This anomeric carbon can then lead to two slightly different ring versions called alpha anima and beta anomers. It depends on which way a key hydroxyl group points, sort of up or down relative to the ring. Think of it like a handle that can be grabbed differently. We use Howarth formulas to show these 3D rings much better than the flat Fisher projections for this. And in solution, these alpha and beta forms are constantly switching back and forth, opening and closing. That's called meter rotation, a little molecular dance. Okay, so glucose is the big star, mm -hmm. but it's got a whole team, right? These hexose derivatives, yeah. they have really specialized roles, like amino sugars and acetyl glucosamine. You swap a hydroxyl for an amino group, and suddenly it's key for bacterial cell walls. Exactly. Small change, critical function. Then there are deoxy sugars, like L-fucose, literally missing an oxygen. Again, different job. And acidic sugars, like uronic acids, they get a negative charge from a carboxyl group. Right. That charge is important for their roles. And crucially, phosphate groups often get attached. Glucose 6 downs phosphate, for example. Ah, yes. Phosphorylation. That's a metabolic masterstroke. It traps the sugar inside the cell, stops it leaking out, and it kind of activates it, primes it for the next steps in metabolic pathways. Really clever. Absolutely. A metabolic linchpin, as you said. And building on that, let, let's talk about reducing sugars. What does that actually mean? Okay, so a sugar is reducing if its anomeric carbon is free, not locked in a glycosidic bond. Remember that dynamic equilibrium between the ring and the small amount of open chain form. That open form has a reactive aldehyde group. This free aldehyde can react with and reduce other compounds. Like classically, it reduces copper ions, Cu2+, in tests, giving a color change. And the simple chemistry has huge real-world applications, doesn't it? Like in box 7-2 about diabetes. Precisely. 
Since glucose is a reducing sugar, its level in blood can be measured, but blood glucose jumps around a lot, so a single test is just a snapshot. That's where HbA1c glycated hemoglobin comes in. Hemoglobin in red blood cells reacts non-enzymatically with glucose over time. The amount of HbA1c tells you the average blood glucose over weeks, like the lifespan of the red blood cell, about 120 days. So it's a much better picture of long-term control. Exactly. And dangerously high levels mean prolonged high sugar, which leads to nasty things called advanced glycation end products, AGEs. These AGEs damage proteins and are linked to serious diabetes complications, kidney failure, heart disease. It shows how basic chemistry impacts health profoundly. It really does. Okay, yeah. let's move up a step. Disaccharides. Two sugars join together. They're linked by an O-glycosidic bond, right? That's the one. Maltose, for instance, is two glucoses linked and it's still reducing. Yes, because one of the glucose units still has a free anomeric carbon that can open up. Okay, so that reducing aspect is key. It is. Take lactose milk sugar, that's galactose linked to glucose. Also reducing, we need the enzyme lactase to break that bond to digest it. If you lack lactase, the lactose goes undigested to the large intestine, pulls water in, and you get lactose intolerance symptoms. Bloating, discomfort, bacteria fermenting it. Ah, uh, okay, but then there's sucrose, table sugar. Right, sucrose is glucose linked to fructose. But it's different. Both anomeric carbons, the reactive ones, are tied up in the glycosidic bond, glc aloofru. This means neither ring can easily open, so sucrose is non-reducing. And that makes it stable. Very stable. Ideal for energy storage and transport in plants. That's why they use it. Trehalose in insects is another non-reducing one. Energy store sometimes even acts like antifreeze for them. Amazing versatility just linking two units. OK, let's go bigger. Polysaccharides. Nature's polymers hundreds, thousands of sugar units mm -hmm. for storage and structure. And they can be homopolysaccharides, one type of monomer, or heteropolysaccharides with different types mixed. Correct. And here's a really key difference compared to proteins or DNA. Polysaccharide synthesis isn't template driven. There's no blueprint dictating the exact length. The enzymes just keep adding units so you get a range of molecular weights, not one precise size. Huh. That's a fundamental difference now they're made. Okay, so storage. Plants use starch, mm -hmm. right? A mix of amylose and amylopectin. Yes. Amylose is the unbranched chain. Amylopectin is highly branched. Both are glucose polymers. And in animals, we use glycogen, mostly in liver and muscle. Right. And here's a really neat biological insight, kind of an aha moment. Why store glucose as this huge glycogen polymer instead of just lots of free glucose molecules? Good question. Why? Osmolarity. If all that glucose in your liver, say, was free monomers, the concentration would be sky high. Water would rush into the cells by osmosis. And they burst. Exactly. They'd swell and lies. But linking glucose into glycogen, the cell dramatically lowers the number of solute molecules, avoiding osmotic disaster. Plus, glycogen's highly branched structure is genius. It gives tons of non-reducing ends. Mm -hmm. Enzymes can chew glucose off many ends simultaneously for rapid energy release when you need it fast. Biochemical brilliance. That is clever. Solves a big problem and makes it efficient. Okay, shifting gears to structural roles. Cellulose in plants, that's the tough cybrous stuff. Wood, cotton, water insoluble. Also made of glucose, just like starch. So what's the difference? Why is cellulose so different? Both just glucose polymers. It all comes down to the glycosidic linkage. Starch has alpha and four links. These let the chains coil up into helices. Okay. Cellulose uses beta linkages. That tiny change, alpha versus beta, forces the chains into straight extended conformations. These straight chains can then line up perfectly side by side. Uh, like stacking planks. Exactly. And they form extensive hydrogen bonds between the chains. Lots of them. This creates incredibly strong, rigid fibers. That's why cellulose provides structural strength to plants. Loose coil versus super strong rope. Incredible difference from one bond type. Yeah. And it's, it's not just plants, right? Chitin. Right. Chitin in insect exoskeletons, crab shells, another structural homopolysaccharide, very similar to cellulose, also beta linkages. But there's a modification at carbon, too. Instead of a hydroxyl group, it has an N-acetylglucosamine unit and acetylated amino group. And that makes Even it... tougher and more water resistant. Perfect for an exoskeleton. Makes sense. And bacteria have their own version, peptidoglycan. Mm -hmm. A heteropolymer this time. Alternating N-acetylglucosamine and N-acetylmeramic acid units, cross-linked by short peptides, forms a strong mesh-like bag around the bacterium, preventing it from bursting from internal pressure. Vital for them. 
which makes it a target for us. Absolutely. Lysozyme, the enzyme in our tears and saliva, breaks the glycosidic bonds in peptidagoglycan, kills bacteria. And penicillin. Penicillin blocks the enzymes that make those peptide crosslinks, weakens the wall, the bacterium dies. Classic antibiotic action. Amazing how we exploit these molecular details. <laughs> okay, moving to animal tissues. Glycosaminoglycans. Gags. Yes, gags. These are found extensively in the extracellular matrix that's stuff between our cells. They're long heteropolysaccharides, and their defining feature is a very high density of negative charges, usually from sulfate groups and uronic acids. Negative charges, what does that do? It forces the chains to retell each other and adopt these extended rod-like shapes. They also attract a lot of water. This creates volume, lubrication, and elasticity. Think of hyaluronin, a huge jag in joint fluid. It makes it viscous, acts as a lubricant and shock absorber, also in the eyes of vitreous humor. Okay. And then there's heparin, a highly sulfated gag used as an anticoagulant drug. It works by binding to antithrombin, a protein, and massively boosting its ability to shut down blood clotting enzymes like thrombin. Precise electrostatic interactions are key. And problems with gags can cause diseases. Yes. Genetic defects in their synthesis or breakdown can lead to serious conditions like Hurler syndrome affecting bone development and more. Shows how vital they are. Right. Now let's get into how carbs carry actual information. Glycoconjugants. Carbs linked to proteins or lipids. Where? Forming the glycocalyx on cell surfaces. Exactly. The glycocalyx is this dense, fuzzy coat of carbohydrates on almost all our cells. It's like the cell's ID badge, its fingerprint, its communication antenna, mediating interactions with the outside world. So what are the main types? Well, there are three main classes. First, proteoglycans. These are huge. Think of a core protein with many long sulfated gag chains attached, like agrican and cartilage, which absorbs shock. They organize tissues, bind growth factors, participate in coagulation. The specific sulfation patterns act like codes for binding. Okay, huge ones. What else? Second, glycoproteins. Here, proteins have smaller but often very complex and branched oligosaccharides attached. They can be O-linked to serther or N-linked to acin. These sugar chains do all sorts of things, affect protein folding and solubility, act as sorting signals, sending proteins to the right place, protect proteins from breakdown. Really diverse function. Incredibly diverse. And genetic disorders messing up glycosylation have severe developmental effects, highlighting how critical it is. And the third type? Glycolipids. Lipids in cell membranes with carbohydrate head groups. Gangliosides in neurons are a key example, important for nerve function. And in bacteria, you have lipopolysaccharides, LPS, on the outer membrane of gram-negative species. The sugar part determines the bacterial serotype, how our immune system recognizes it. The lipid part, lipid A, is a potent endotoxin, causes toxic shock symptoms. Okay, this leads us to maybe the most mind-bending part, mm. the sugar coat. <sighs> It sounds almost futuristic, but it's real biology, glycobiology. You think DNA or proteins hold all the info, but oligosaccharides? They pack an incredible density of information. It's truly astonishing, yeah. Glycans, these sugar chains, are way more information dense than nucleic acids or proteins. Why? Because monosaccharides can be linked together in many different ways, and they can branch. Proteins and DNA are linear. Branching. Think about it. With just a few different sugar building blocks, you can create billions of unique structures if they're, say, six units long, hexamers. Compare that to maybe millions of hexapeptides or only thousands of hexanucleotides. Each unique sugar structure presents a different 3D shape, a different word in this code, ready for specific recognition. It's an information explosion built from simple sugars. Wow. And the readers of this code? Proteins called lectins. Exactly. Lectins are the proteins that have evolved to bind specific carbohydrate structures with high affinity and specificity. They decode the sugar message. And what kinds of jobs do they do? Oh, a huge range. They regulate how long hormones circulate in the blood. They act like garbage collectors, recognizing and helping remove old red blood cells or glycoproteins that have lost certain sugar caps, like sialic acid. Quality control. Okay. Any other big examples? Absolutely. Selectins. These are lectins on the surface of cells lining our blood vessels and also on immune cells. During inflammation, selectins on the vessel wall grab onto specific sugars, like Cialis X, on passing white blood cells, the leukocytes. What does that do? It slows them down, makes them roll along the vessel wall near the infection site. This rolling is the crucial first step that allows them to eventually stop and squeeze out into the tissue to fight the infection. So interrupting that could be medically useful. Definitely. It's a major target for drugs against chronic inflammation, maybe even preventing cancer metastasis, as some cancer cells use similar mechanisms. And it's not just our cells using this code, right? Yeah. Viruses, 
bacteria. They absolutely exploit it. Influenza virus is a classic case. Its hemagglutinin and protein is a lectin that binds to sialic acid on our cell surfaces to get in. Then, to get out and spread, it uses another enzyme, neuraminidase, to snip off those sialic acids. Ah, uh, so drugs like Tamiflu target that neuraminidase. Precisely. They block the exit, trapping the virus. It's a constant biochemical arms race centered on sugar recognition. Bacterial toxins often work similarly, binding to host cell sugars. And lectins work inside cells, too. Yes. A key example is intracellular sorting. There's a specific tag, mannose 6-phosphate, added to certain proteins in the Golgi. Lectin receptors recognize this tag and direct those proteins specifically to the lysosome, the cell's recycling center. It's like a molecular ZIP code ensuring correct delivery. And often, these lectin-sugar interactions are multivalent. Multiple weak binding sites work together. Like Velcro. Lots of little hooks. Kind of like that, yeah. It dramatically increases the overall strength and specificity of the interaction, makes things like cell rolling possible. It's clear understanding this is vital, but it sounds incredibly complex to study these structures. All the branching, different links, must be an analytical nightmare. It is challenging, much more so than sequencing linear polymers like DNA or protein. We need a whole toolkit. There are chemical methods like uh, exhaustive methylation, which helps figure out where the linkages are. Enzymatic methods use specific enzymes, exoglycosidases, that nibble sugars off the ends one by one, helping sequence them. And modern techniques. Oh, yeah. Mass spectrometry and high-resolution NMR spectroscopy are absolutely essential now. They give incredibly detailed structural information, even from tiny amounts. And another big advance is chemical synthesis, especially solid phase synthesis. We can now build specific, defined oligosaccharide structures in the lab. This is huge because isolating pure single structures from natural mixtures is often incredibly difficult due to all the variation. Okay, so let's bring this all together. We started thinking of carbs as maybe just fuel or building blocks, simple triggers. But we've deep dived today and seen there's so much more. There's this incredibly sophisticated language, a complex sugar code. It's absolutely essential for life's most intricate processes, from cell structure stopping them bursting, to how cells talk to each other, how immune cells find targets, how viruses invade. These sugars are doing the real heavy lifting. Indeed. It makes you think, doesn't it, how these seemingly simple molecules are writing such complex messages all around us and inside us, shaping our health, our interactions constantly. What other hidden sugar codes might be influencing our biology right now, just waiting for us to decipher them? A fascinating thought to end on. Thank you for joining us on this deep dive into the world of carbohydrates. We really appreciate you being part of the Deep Dive family.